Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, glad you're here. This district has been home to a number of historic cases, and certainly the trial of Patty Hearst was one of the most noteworthy and compelling. The daughter of a media mogul uh, whose abduction and life on the lamb was breathlessly followed by the media, many of whose compatriots were uh, killed in a televised shootout in Los Angeles, uh, watched by millions. Uh, today, we're lucky to have uh, three panelists who were intimately involved in this matter. Uh, and so, uh, to lead off today, the Honorable Lowell Jensen, who knows, needs no uh, introduction here, uh, who was the district attorney in Alameda County, is going to discuss the emergence of the Symbionese Liberation Army, uh, in the assassination of Dr. Uh, Foster up through the time of the abduction of uh, Patty Hearst. Uh, then Rob James, uh, who was not intimately involved but uh, knows a ton about it, is going to give us uh, a brief uh, historical interlude. Uh, what happened from the time of the induction until the time of the arrest? Uh, and then we're lucky to have uh, Dave Bancroft, who is a member of the prosecution team, uh, and Ralph Swanson, who clerked for um, Judge Carter, the trial judge. Uh, and they've divided the trial into eight different stages. And so we're going to go through uh, each of those uh, and discuss how the trial unfolded. And then my dad sentenced uh, Patty Hearst. And so I'm going to bring him back into the central part of this story uh, <laughs> at, at the end. Uh, and we'll save some time. I'm going to try and do this. We'll, we'll try and get this done in about an hour, although there are a lot of war stories to be told. Uh, and, uh, and then we'll save some time for questions. And just to set the stage. Uh, for those of you uh, who didn't live in those times, it was wild. <laughs> this was the capital of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Uh, and uh, it, at that time, the Zodiac Killer, who was a uh, serial killer, was on the loose. The Zebra Killers, who uh, racially, uh, who were involved in 15 uh, racial murders and eight attempted murders were on the loose, uh, and, uh, and as reported in American Heiress uh, by Jeffrey Tubin, in 1972, there were 1,962 actual or attempted bombings in the United States. In 1973, there were 1,955 actual or attempted bombings. And in 1974, there were 2,044 actual attempt or attempted bombings. So now return with us uh, to those thrilling days of yesteryear. Um, where's the district attorney? District Attorney Jensen, hi o o o a Thank you very much. Um, this starts on an election day. Um, in January 6th, or not, excuse me, November 6th, it is a familiar election day right now. Uh, this was January 6th of 1973. Uh, as I said, I was the district attorney and there were some civic events that day about elections and there was a civic gathering that night at Jack London, Jack Goodman Square, Jack Goodman Hall in the uh, Jack London Square. And one of the Oakland's finest citizens was a featured speaker, it was Earl Warren. Uh, and myself and my wife were in attendance at the, at the gathering. And Earl Warren spoke for a little while, and, and I had a tap on my shoulder, and it was an Oakland policeman. Uh, and he asked me to come out, and it turned out that Marcus Foster, who was the superintendent of Oakland schools, had just been shot and killed. Uh, and that was it for the next two years, really. That, that case started then. Uh, what had happened is, is Marcus Foster had been the superintendent of schools in Oakland for a couple of years. He'd been tremendous. He had come from Philadelphia, and he turned out to be a great uh, leader in the school system. Uh, and it was, it was a real tragedy when he was, uh, his life was cut down. <clears throat> his assistant was a man named Robert Blackburn who came with him from Philadelphia. And the two of them on this January or this November 6th, uh, had been at, at school meetings, and then at the evening they got out, uh, and they were going to go home and vote. 
Um, and on the way out, there's a, a parking lot behind the school buildings by Lake Merritt in Oakland. And as they walked out there, uh, Blackburn saw a couple of persons standing against the wall. He said they were um, about 5'7", five, 5'9". Five, uh, they looked like they were male. Um, they had caps on. One of them was more darker complected than the other, and they walked by, and he, he, he couldn't get much of a, uh, a look at them. He couldn't identify them in terms of who they were, but there was these, these persons standing there, and they went to the car, which was just a, a few steps beyond that. Just as he, around, he went around the car, and Marcus Foster was just by the car, and the two people who were standing there started shooting. Uh, and Marcus Foster was shot. He was hit six times by a 380 Walther pistol being fired. He was hit once by a 38 Rossi pistol being fired. And as Blackburn went around the car, another person on the other side shot him with a shotgun. And so he was uh, injured, but Marcus Foster was killed. There was an execution shot even that, uh, that uh, involved in the matter. But uh, this happened and it was, it was a terrible shock, a terrible surprise. Um, and it turned out that we really didn't know anything about the case. There was no idea about it. Nobody knew anything about it, who the persons were. Black Blackman was the only witness. He survived. And he was the only witness to the shooting itself, and he couldn't identify anybody. Uh, a, somebody in the neighborhood had seen three people running away toward Lake Merritt. But that's all we had. And we had the, the shooting, and nobody knew anything about it. One of the interesting bits was... When the autopsy was done, the autopsy surgeon, one of the bullets had gone through Dr. Um, Foster's body and ended up in his pocket. And the, the tip of the bullet, he, he, the doctor smelled it and he couldn't understand it and they checked it and the bullet had been hollowed out on the tip and cyanide, potassium cyanide had been put in the bullet and waxed over. So it, it was a rather unusual thing. But we, as I said, we didn't know anything about the case and then the day after it all happened, all of a sudden, KPFA, the radio station, and the Tribune got communiques, they were called, and there were multi-page descriptions of what had happened, and it described something they called the Symbionese Liberation Army, and they identified themselves, not in person, but as persons who were interested in the masses, and they had done this in order to... Uh, take Blackburn away from what the evil things he'd been doing to the masses in Oakland. It was supposed to get everybody excited and everybody would rise against the government. Uh, but they described this, and they described themselves as being part of this group, which they called, as I said, the Symbionese Liberation Army. Nobody had ever heard about this. I mean, it was absolutely brand new. None of the intelligence agencies around there had ever heard of them, both the local agencies and the, um, the federal government. Uh, and nobody knew anything about it. As a matter of fact, when they went out into the community to try to find out what was going on, it was, it was such that the idea of SLA to have the masses, masses rise because of this was, rather than that, you had outrage, and the outrage included the Black Panthers, for example. They couldn't understand what had happened. Uh, and so all of a sudden, we had this group of people who identified themselves, and now it had the calling card because they identified themselves and saying this murder was committed by us with potassium cyanide, with cyanide bullets. So it, it rang true, and now became the problem of finding out who these people were. Nobody knew much or anything at all about them, and uh, we now started in on the investigation. Uh, nothing happened until January, and in January uh, of the next year, January 10, uh, a patrolman in Concord was on duty, on patrol, and it was late at night. It was around midnight. And he, he saw a car driving around slowly in the neighborhood and backtracking, and very, it was strange. He stopped the car. There were two men in the car. Uh, they couldn't really explain what they were doing. I mean, he asked for one of them to get out, and as the guy got out, he had a gun in his, uh, his pants, and he grabbed the gun, and the shootout and he started shooting what was going on. The officer called for help. The car drove off, and the guy who had gotten out of the car ran away. So the Concord police came out, and they found the car, and the driver was a man named Russell Little. Uh, and then after a little while, they found the person who had run away, and that person was named Joseph Romero. Uh, 
uh, and Joseph Romero had a 380 Walther pistol on him, and that pistol turned out to be the pistol that had killed Marcus Foster. Uh, so now you had uh, a couple of persons there, and in the car they were driving, there were a bunch of leaflets and patterns there that was SLA materials. And so you now had some people from the SLA, and now you suddenly, just by chance, uh, you had found these two people, and you now knew that there, here was the SLA. Well, that evening, after the arrest had taken place early in the morning, uh, a couple of blocks away, uh, neighbors saw a car back out of a driveway at one of the houses, and the house burst into flames about the same time. It exploded in, in a fire. When they came in, it turned out that this fire was a kind of a flash fire. It, it, the way it had been set up, the uh, drapes had been tacked back in the house, and the idea apparently was it was going to break out the windows and the house would blur and burn up, but it didn't. The, the fire just flashed out and went out. And so what happened is it turned out that this house had a treasure trove of evidence in it. There were thousands and thousands of documents. There were guns. There were bullets. And there were even the map and the surveillance notes for the Foster murder scene uh, that had, were there, and also all of the materials that put together the, the communiques. And so now you had a safe house of the SLA, it was what it turned out to be. Uh, there were five people who had lived in the safe house. It was uh, Ramiro and Little, and there was a man named Donald DeFries, who turns out to be a critical part of this story. And also two women, Nancy Link Perry and a Patricia Soltisic. There were five people who lived there. Nancy Link Perry had rented the house under another name earlier that year. Uh, and, and they had left the house, and they thought it was going to burn, but they left the, all of the evidence in terms of what had taken place. And so you knew who the SLA was as far as those people were concerned. It turns out now that the SLA had been in existence for a couple of months, only a couple of months, because Donald DeFries was a an African-American who had been in prison, California prison for robbery. And he had been in Soledad and he had walked away, he jumped the fence and walked away. Uh, and he met with people who had, in Oakland, who had been visiting the prison. And some of these people uh, then got together and he then started living in Oakland uh, with Patricia Soltisix, uh, one of the, the people who had been visitor at the prisons. And Nancy Link Perry also was there. So they then got together, and the five of them were the core of the SLA that lived in the house in Concord. There were other people. DeFries lived in, in, uh, in the house, as I said, in Concord. But there's a couple of people. Uh, we're going to hear a little bit about Bill and Emily Harris, who were uh, also part of the SLA, but they lived in a different place. And there were a couple of other women who had been a part of the group. There was Camilla Hall and uh, Angela Atwood, they, and that made up the SLA. And it had a group in Oakland and then the Concord Safe House. Right, so now you had a couple of people in custody uh, who were the members of the SLA. Uh, and we now started looking for all the rest of the people who were involved. And then that had been this situation, and uh, it had obviously, it, was now becoming more intense of an investigation. And then in February of 1974, the um, bank robbery took place. Uh, no, excuse me, excuse me, that's the, uh, that's the kidnap. <laughs> Get the, the sequence. And the sequence is after Romero and Little had been arrested, a month or so later in February, they kidnapped Patty Hearst. Now in the materials in the house in Concord, there'd been a list of people, they surveilled a lot of people around as potential targets, they call them, potential targets for attack and for kidnapping. One of them was Patty Hurst. Uh, so she was on the notes of the SLA at the time uh, before this all happened. But after uh, Little and Romero had gone to prison, then the, um, excuse me, the, the, abduc the abduction takes place. All right, and so as the abduction takes place, we're going to uh, switch over to uh, Rob, who's going to walk us through what happened during uh, the time that uh, Patty Hearst was after she was abducted and while she was on the lam. So go ahead. Good. Thanks, Judge Oreck. And like yourself, I'm here by right of ancestor. Uh, in my case, it's my law partner, Ed Davis, who was a uh, law clerk to uh, Judge Carter and was on the U.S. Attorney's staff with David Bancroft. Uh, he uh, then entered private practice where he was a champion of the First Amendment, 
uh, and but still told stories of dueling with the psychiatrists in this newly opened field between law and psychiatry uh, in this event. And he'd be gently but firmly uh, elbowing me aside uh, to get to this table uh, here today. Well, there's an air of theatricality to the SLA. The reason they didn't know about it, it was nine members. Uh, and so communiques by General Field Marshal Sinque, um, the um, uh, Donald DeFries uh, pseudonym, uh, came from West Coast Operations Unit Number 4, uh, creating all sorts of images of a vast uh, network. Uh, and this theatricality was lim uh, literal because these were drama majors. Several of them were majors in drama from Indiana uh, University. Uh, so it would be uh, almost a comic opera were it not for the cyanide bullets and other uh, lethality um, uh, of this uh, group. How did they come to Patty Hearst? Well, in December of 73, an engagement photograph ran of Patty Hearst with her fiance, Stephen Weed, one of the many people severely impacted uh, by this case, uh, announcing that she was an undergraduate at Cal. At those days, very easy to find the address and apartment number of a Berkeley uh, uh, undergraduate. Um, and she was uh, um, uh, whisked away, Weed was uh, beaten and run off uh, from the apartment. And she was held in Daly City uh, from February 4th uh, in a closet, uh, hooded or handcuffed, uh, only allowed to come out at limited intervals, fed on revolutionary uh, 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 material and uh, feeding into the guilt complex of uh, someone affluent of this type. I think it's very difficult for any of us to put ourselves in that position for uh, the many days that were uh, spent in that, uh, in, in, in that condition. Uh, there was sex uh, between uh, Hearst and at least one of the uh, captors, which got extraordinary attention in these psychiatric um, examinations, uh, one of uh, whom was uh, a man named Willie Wolf, and we'll hear more about that in the, uh, in, in, in the trial. Why did they do it? Uh, as with every revolutionary moment, the question is, what next? Uh, if they had feeble hopes that they could exchange Hearst for the release of Ramiro and Little, that was dashed very quickly. Uh, federal and state officials were not going to countenance that. And so the question is, what do you do uh, with one of the most famous hostages um, uh, ever taken? And the first unusual thing is that instead of negotiating with the family, they negotiated um, with the public. Uh, tapes were issued um, uh, to radio station KPFA, which would uh, broadcast these tapes to the family to the uh, police and to the world at the same time. The tapes first came out with um, Patricia Hearst in a flat affect, mom, dad, I'm okay, obviously reading texts. But over time, they got more of a, uh, a personal uh, flair associated with them. They came up with the idea next of not demanding ransom uh, for the kidnappers, but rather giveaways, uh, proposing $70 in free food to the, uh, um, every person in California on any public assistance, including social security. Uh, which would have been about 400 million. The Hearst uh, Family Incorporation came back with a more limited uh, program, eventually $2 million in a chaotic giveaway, and that sort of died away. Again, what now? And just as the world was getting used to the idea of, host of uh, kidnapping involving a donation, came out the tape uh, in late March where she said that she had been given the choice of uh, being released safely in a, in a, in a uh, free location or staying to fight with her comrades. And I have chosen to stay and fight and I have been given the name Tanya uh, after uh, Che Guevara's uh, um, companion. And this is when we see the uh, uh, iconic photograph of Patty Hearst uh, with the machine gun and the beret in front of the seven-headed uh, Cobra flag. That photograph was taken at 1827 uh, Golden Gate Avenue. And if that address sounds familiar, that's exactly right. The, uh, to, the safe house at that time was 14 blocks away from the building where the FBI had its uh, manhunt uh, set up for the North American uh, continent. Just when people were trying to get their heads around that, they were shocked to see the bank robbery, which occurred on April 15th. Many gangs case banks uh, to see the security devices, but unlike most where they look for devices that can be uh, countermanded, the uh, uh, SLA was looking to exploit the security device, and they found a bank branch, the, Tassian, uh, the uh, Hibernia Bank at 22nd and Noriega, that had the newfangled security camera. And when Donald DeFries and Hearst and the others burst into that bank, Patty Hearst stood exactly where images of her could be uh, recorded. She was supposed to give a speech. It didn't happen. But they whisked off with uh, $10,000 and pieces of silver, wounding a couple of unlucky uh, customers who wandered in at the, at the wrong time. Uh, and all of a sudden, uh, Patty Hearst went from District Attorney Jensen's uh, kidnapped victim 
to uh, first a material witness and then on to uh, most wanted posters. So San Francisco was far too hot for them at that point, and so the nine members of the SLA went off in three cars uh, down to Southern California, where Donald DeFries and eight uh, white men and women uh, went to uh, um, uh, hide out in South Central uh, Los Angeles. Um, they first went to one house and then a second house that was occupied by a number of people, and a grandmother came to whisk her grandchildren away. She recognized um, uh, DeFries or had heard of him and dressed him down for the Foster assassination. Um, DeFries argues with her and lets Granny go. And shortly thereafter, Granny lets the police know that it's the yellow frame house, uh, six uh, um, uh, uh, houses in from the, uh, from the corner. And uh, the New York, I mean, excuse me, the LA Police Department had developed a SWAT team after the uh, Watts riots, had never had a chance to use it. It was under the control of a middle manager named Daryl Gates, uh, who later became the uh, police chief in the other trial. Uh, of that uh, crazy uh, century. Um, and so um, at that uh, point, uh, they gave perfunctory news to get out. Uh, and they declined. Uh, the SLA fired two to 3,000 rounds of ammo out of that house. The LAPD fired 5,300 rounds uh, and uh, uh, tear gas uh, into that house, eventually catching fire, incinerating uh, everyone inside. They later went through the bodies and confirmed that none of them was Patty Hearst. Where was Patty Hearst? She was shopping. Uh, Bill and Emily Harris and Patty Hearst had taken one of the cars and had gone shopping uh, and left Patty in the van opposite a sporting goods store. Uh, Bill Harris has the idea of shoplifting a, a bandolier in the, uh, in the uh, store. He uh, uh, comes out and is apprehended in a citizen's arrest, and Patty Hearst in the van looks up. And she could have done many things, including nothing, drive away, uh, hands up. Instead, she picks up first one and then a second automatic weapon and fires guns at the awning and then at the street, dispersing the would-be arresters, uh, getting Bill uh, and Emily Harris back in the van. And they begin to take a round of uh, carjackings and kidnappings as they head to Disneyland. Um, they go to a motel in Anaheim where they flick on the news and see the conflagration. Uh, and clearly at that point, Patty Hearst knew that Donald DeFries was not her adversary, but perhaps uh, members of law enforcement that uh, were going to take these kinds of actions were now the, uh, the, the enemy. She mixes up with a large cast of characters. Uh, they spend the summer on the run all the way to Pennsylvania, where they do memoirs and tape recordings, and come back to California in September of 74. That's a full year before she's arrested. And that year is spent half in Sacramento, where to make ends meet, they uh, rob more banks. And one of these robberies goes terribly wrong when a customer is killed uh, by a shotgun blast at the very beginning of the robbery. Hearst is not in the bank at that time, so there's no eyewitness. But she apparently was in the getaway car or a switch car, uh, and therefore implicated in a bank robbery where a murder occurs, a crime of greater severity than what she faces here in San Francisco. The second half is spent in San Francisco, where the group's uh, pie chart of activity is divided between car bombings and day jobs. Uh, car bombing explosive devices under police cars and other vehicles in Emeryville, Los Angeles, the Marin County Civic Center. And the day jobs would be things like painting houses in San Mateo County for cash. At this time, there are so many loose ends, the noose is tightening. The FBI follows the uh, house painters back first to one house in San Francisco. They come out, go to a second house in San Francisco with a man who looks a lot like Bill Harris. This guy's dressed in shorts, takes his clothes to a laundromat, FBI wanders into the laundromat, sees a scar on his uh, left knee uh, that looks a lot like the surgery that uh, Bill Harris got in the US Army in service uh, to our country. Uh, and shortly, Bill and Emily Harris are arrested. And as Tubin says in the book, almost as an afterthought, they thought, what about that first house? They hadn't set a watch on it or anything. They drove back to it. And there, rising from her kitchen table uh, is Patty Hearst. So that is uh, September 18th. Uh, 1975, uh, and the, uh, suddenly this all comes to life as we see Patty with her uh, hands handcuffed and clenched in revolutionary pose, uh, declaring her occupation as urban uh, guerrilla. Uh, and Judge Oreck, that's the time when I think we should turn it to those affected by this event I most directly. I think it's high time. So, um, Dave, let's take on, uh, it's sort of start at that moment, at that time, and then talk about how you staff that this 
uh, case up and what the trial atmosphere was um, before the thing got going. Yeah, so let me explain a little bit as to why I'm uh, here as the um, sort of prosecutive representative. Um, the case was tried in, in large part by my boss, Jim Browning, but it turned out that I was, at the time, chief of special prosecutions in the US Attorney's Office and part of that jurisdiction, if that's what you call it, would be uh, terrorism. So guess what? At the time of the trial, um, I met with Jim and uh, others, um, and it was decided that uh, I would handle the um, defense uh, psychiatrists as well as do the legal research, uh, supervise the legal research and uh, memorandum. But um, it, it, this was a, a big deal because uh, the criminal division, the U.S. Attorney's Office, consisted of about 15 assistants. And uh, we sucked up about uh, six of them for the purposes of this trial. And that was not uh, a short-term, uh, that was not a short-term commitment. Um, so the first, uh, and you could argue that, uh, you could say that the first critical uh, decision was how are we going to deal uh, with this case and how are we going to prosecute it. But before I get into the particulars of that, I want to uh, take you back uh, to uh, that time and the big first day of the trial. Um, the trial atmosphere in this case was like something I have never seen nor really heard of since. First of all, the trial was in this courtroom. And so far as we know, uh, that has been the only trial taking place in the ceremonial courtroom, even though, as you'll see, there are two jury boxes. The publicity with respect to this case was, uh, was, a, uh, was, a, was a barn burner. Um, the foreign press was here, the national press was here, the local press was here. The case concerned an heiress who had been an abductee, uh, who had then turned SLA cohort um, who had then had turned into bank robber and then a shooter and eluded capture for one and a half years and then as referred to when she's arrested refers to herself as an urban guerrilla. So from a press standpoint, uh, this was uh, one big uh, deal in case. As to the press, there were special uh, procedures in place. This jury box here was assigned by Judge Carter for the press. And he had to, so you can imagine a case in which the jury is staring during most of the trial <laughs> at the press, and the press is staring at the jury. And meanwhile, Judge Carter had to assign, there were so many artists who wanted to come and <laughs> do pictures, that he had to do it on a rotating basis, couldn't allow them all in the courtroom at the same time. Um, there were four to eight attorneys at each counsel table. You would say, I, wait a second, I just, uh, I, I, you could argue, uh, if Lee Bailey was supposed to have been the defense counsel, that's true. But as you can well imagine, <clears throat> uh, Randy Hurst wanted to make sure that his corporate people were there, that his personal attorney was there. Uh, F. Lee Bailey had an assistant. And on our side, we had so much, uh, I mean, putting on a case in chief, when a case which uh, actually had uh, ultimately 65 witnesses testified over 35 trial days with over 1,000 exhibits. Um, this took a terrific uh, man effort and organization to, to, to bring off. Um, the first day of trial, uh, I mean, evidence-producing, evidence there was in this corner a, this was the day before jum jumbotrons, but the FBI had set up a massive, huge, I mean, covered, I mean, it was, when I walked in and saw it for the first time before the trial started to, to plan how this was going to go, but I, my jaw dropped. I'd never seen anything like this. Huge screen in, in, in which would be projected the films of the bank robbery itself. Um, so there were a number of, uh, never saw anything like this before, uh, elements to this, to this trial. With respect to the film of the bank robbery, um, this was somewhat new technology. And so the, the, the framing and the projection was a tricky proposition. 
And the, the point of showing that bank robbery film was that you could see in that bank robbery film the alacrity with which Patty Hearst moved. She was not looking around confused. She was not uh, halting. She was not looking for directions. Um, and although it was not, uh, you know, she wasn't uh, shooting her own weapon, when she left the bank with, their, with her cohorts, she dropped a clip from her weapon. And the clip spilled out two bullets. What did she do? She bent down and picked them up and slammed them back into her weapon. So the, the notion that she was less than, a, uh, than an animated participant in the bank robbery was, if not conclusively, at least uh, significantly uh, portrayed as something quite different. Now you're getting to your closing argument. Before um, <laughs> I was thinking, before we get there, uh, Ralph, what about the staffing for the judge, and what were you doing up until the first day of the trial, if anything? Wondering what in the devil I was doing there to start with. Well, first of all, a lot of you may not know what a law clerk does. There are some here. I see one in particular who uh, who was one, but. Basically, the law clerks are hired right out of law school uh, to work with the judge for a period of time, one or two years. Um, our job is to research the law, um, advise the judge on what we found in the law, and then when he asks us to write draft opinions um, or rulings and the like. Um, and so that's what I did. But I must say that when I first started, which I think I started September the 4th, something like that, of, of 1975. I was right out of law school. I was 28 years old. Okay, do the math, I don't care. Um, <laughs> and I was, if you wanna say wet behind the ears, that's quite true, but here I was. Two weeks later, that headline was shown and Patty Hearst was um, captured. We had already known, both my co-clerk Robin Donahue, who unfortunately was not able to be here tonight, uh, both of us knew before we started with Judge Carter that he had already been assigned this case um, while she was still on the run and because she was indicted in, abs in absentia, so she wasn't around. And so we knew that if, if she ever were going to be tried, we'd have something to do with that. And sure enough, two weeks later, we did. I remember very vividly going to the arraignment, and that was the first time when I went into a courtroom where there were more people from the press there than anybody else. And some of them I recognized uh, from news media. And I said, wow, this is big time. Um, the judge also wanted to make sure, and he was very protective of us. He said, look, this is something that you may never get to do again in your lives. It may be the biggest case you'll ever see. And there's going to be a lot of publicity. And you need to be prepared for that. And he was very protective to make sure that we stayed away from the press. And yet, and I forever will be in my gratitude to him, he wanted to make sure that we got to see this. So both Robin and I sat right down there in that behind that little table. It's probably a different table today. And as Dave has pointed out, the press was right over there. Um, my job when I wasn't watching the trial was to research the law and we had a lot of motions to research and write. But I actually started to think I was pretty important. Here I was facing <laughs> all of the audience like I'm facing you now, looking out, seeing faces like Shana Alexander from, I know I'm dating myself again, but she did point and counterpoint back in the day. Um, there was a gentleman from CBS News that I actually got to be friendly with, although he was, to his credit, never tried to pump me. Was Richard Threlkeld was his name. He was a newscaster and very nice fellow. And every day we'd nod and we'd say hello. And then I'd get home at night and there'd be a sketch of the courtroom. And that famous sketch artist, uh, he had a bald head and a big mustache. I don't remember his name, but he was quite well known. He was here every day drawing up the trial. And you'd see Judge Carter up there on the bench very clearly, and you'd see you know, Dave Bancroft or Jim Browning with their fists raised and making gestures and Bailey looking like this and doing the same thing. Over there were these two stick figures like <laughs> Charlie Brown. And I am, I'm, to this day, I'm sure that he said, 
who are these people and what are they doing there? <laughs> so, but, Ralph, but, let me ask you, um, the, without going into them in any detail, what were the significant pretrial motions okay. that you had to deal with? The most significant pretrial motion, the one that first captured the public eye, was the motion on whether or not uh, Patty was competent to stand trial. And um, we, uh, I was assigned to the case, Judge Carter assigned cases to a particular law clerk just sort of randomly as he would get them. So I did most of the, of the writings on it, but, but Robin participated, and especially when we got burdened, and she got stuck with doing a lot of the other cases that had to be handled. This motion was based upon four, the testimony of four um, psychiatrists, um, three of whom decided or recommended that she be found competent, one of whom did not. Judge Carter, I remember his telling me, he says, I've listened to this, I've read it, I believe under the law she's competent, I'd written a memo, um, so I want you to write up the order. So I did, and it's now a published decision, or was then. But I remember going home that night, and I saw the TV screen, it was John Chancellor, um, NBC Nightly News, and right behind him were words that I had written that day and given to Judge <laughs> Carter. Actually, Judge and Carter wrote Judge, those words. Oh, no, he wrote the words. He wrote the words, <laughs> but I gave him to the, the memo on him with him. And, and so the were there... The point I'm, yeah, the point I'm trying to make is it was quite frightening to see that. <laughs> um, in fact, um, I was really worried that I would hear something like, in a peculiarly worded order today, Judge <laughs> Oliver Carter. That did not happen. Uh, okay. But in any now, case, were there any? The it, and were the, just because I want to move yeah. things, uh, were there any important like motions to suppress or anything else that Judge Carter had to deal with before the trial got going? There were not any motions to suppress that I'm recalling right now. There were a number of them that came up during the trial, which I think Dave is going to mention, and then I'll mention where, where they came out and uh, what we did about them. Okay, so let's get to the first day of the trial and the opening statement. Oh, uh, well, um, frankly, if you ask me to recall the opening statements, I'm not sure that I, I could do that well, but um, the, the one... So... So F. Lee Bailey had made a motion to suppress, this pretrial motion, to suppress um, basically all of, the, uh, all of her activity after the bank robbery on the grounds that it had been coerced. And when we first looked at this motion, I said, this is laughable. Uh, how, could, how could that possibly? The government had no participation whatsoever in whatever coercion was going on. So how could that possibly uh, be a basis for a motion to suppress. Well, um, turns out that there are a few state court cases and maybe a couple of hints in the federal cases that if something is truly coerced, I mean, you can imagine somebody's gun to a head, that it would be, uh, it would be unconstitutional to convict them on the basis of that, on that, if you want to call that, evidence. So, lo and behold, uh, they had made this motion to suppress but Judge Carter wisely said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Uh, I'm going to hear the motion to suppress, but I'm not going to hear it now. How can I possibly decide this without any context of, of uh, relevance as to other things and the, the whole sort of kit and caboodle of the trial evidence itself? That put the prosecution in a very difficult position. We don't know at this point whether or not that evidence is going to be suppressed. And now we're being called upon to make an opening statement about what our evidence is. Uh, this tormented um, Jim Browning, who was giving the opening statement, and uh, he decided to bet the farm, which was to mention it all, let it all hang out in an opening statement. And if that resulted in ultimately a mistrial, or even worse, uh, I suppose you could say, a, a reversal on appeal, then that is the way it was going to have to be, uh, because you just couldn't he just couldn't bring himself to make an opening statement without all the very powerful evidence of her conduct subsequent to the bank robbery. All right. So, so take us forward. Um, there, there was a mid-trial motion to suppress. Yes, yes, there was, and. Uh, uh, I think the defense uh, uh, outside the jury's presence in the mid-trial now uh, put Patty Hurst on the witness stand to just uh, testify to the judge uh, 
She testified that everything that happened after the bank robbery, but including the bank robbery, was all under coercion and uh, therefore um, should be suppressed. When Jim Browning got up to cross-examine her, she, this is outside the presence of the jury, she uh, in part took the Fifth Amendment. Mm -hmm. And Judge Carter indicated at one time that she could do it and at another time that she couldn't do it. Uh, that she could, had no right to take the Fifth Amendment because she had testified about the, uh, the generalities of, uh, of what she had done, but not the particulars. And in that context, uh, could be deemed to have waived her Fifth Amendment privilege. In any event, the consequence of all that was that uh, Judge Carter denied the motion to suppress. But uh, as later on, you'll see that um, the defense tried to claim that uh, in the course of his comments, he had indicated that she had the right to take the Fifth Amendment. So the rubber hit the road when the defense called Patty Hearst to testify in front of the jury. This was a huge moment. Um, it's a tortuous decision for most defense counsel and it's uh, usually a happy circumstance for the prosecution. So Patty Hearst testifying now before the jury, and uh, she's testifying essentially that you know she didn't voluntarily do the bank robbery, that she was coerced, uh, that she was bamboozled, and uh, then the 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 moment of truth came when Jim Browning stood up and started to examine her about her other activity. Now that included, of course, uh, her shootout at Mel's sporting goods store. And it also included her one and a half years uh, on the lam and her activity during that period of time. And at that point, uh, she started to, to testify. And uh, Bailey objected to the questions being asked of her by Browning on the grounds that uh, he was, uh, that those uh, circumstances were all uh, coerced and, uh, and that she had, that those circumstances were all coerced. Uh, and then a very exciting moment occurred uh, for the case and for me personally. Uh, Judge Carter was starting to indicate that she had the right to take the Fifth Amendment to the questions asked by Jim. So Jim Browning looked at me and said, is this the time we want to take this up? And I said, yes, it is. And so he said, well, go at it. So I stood up and I said to Judge Carter, uh, Judge Carter, um, I know your position is that she uh, has the right to take the Fifth Amendment. I'm trying to find the quote because I wrote it out. Yeah, here it is. Uh, I know that that's your position, but what I am urging you is, and I'm quoting here, what I am urging you is, to put it bluntly, that that is just not so. As I reread those words, I said, you know, that's a pretty bold thing to say to a judge. But, very persuasive. <laughs> but I said, we have filed, just filed a memo, a comprehensive legal memo with Supreme Court cases and Ninth Circuit cases. And we firmly believe that we are absolutely right in this, that she has waived her Fifth Amendment privilege and that you should now be ordering her to testify about these events. Uh, it was a Friday. Sometimes you just get lucky. And Judge Carter said, all right, um, we're going to adjourn. I'm going to read your memo. And on Monday morning, he came back in and he said, I've decided it. Uh, you're right. The government's right. Uh, Ms. Hurst, you have to testify about these things. And if you don't, I'm going to have to sanction you. So uh, for 42 times, uh, Jim Browning asked her questions, and she said, I declined to answer on the grounds that the, my answer may tend to incriminate me. And Judge Carter sometimes, but not always, then would order her to testify. All of us had our eyes and ears and uh, our witching sticks uh, pointed at the jury to see uh, what reaction they were having. To be honest with you, um, I couldn't 
tell, except that I knew just instinctively as a litigator that this was not a good day for the defense. Uh, let, me, let me just ask you, uh, yeah. Ralph, were you involved at all in dealing with that memo? We, yes, uh, we talked about it a lot. The, uh, the research that, uh, uh, that I did would indicated that it, this was perfectly, I think the case was Brown versus the United States, and that it was perfectly within the right. How could you remember that after all these uh, years? I, 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 I had a crib sheet. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I did, I did, you know, he, he said, well, I think that under that case, and, and, and just one quick note on that, the other issue that came up was whether or not the, in, the uh, uh, testimony could be, or I should say evidence of the Mel Sporting Goods shootout should be allowed in. And I was really surprised, as was Robin, that for some reason the defense had kind of overlooked, there was a Ninth Circuit case pretty much right on point, which basically said that evidence post the event for which you're charged, indicating your ability to use an instrumentality necessary to, to, uh, uh, to, to uh, commit that crime is admissible as long as it's not too far removed. And this was, what, three weeks. So um, that, that was not that difficult, uh, you know, a, a, a memo to write, shall we say. Uh, and the same thing happened with regard to the Fifth Amendment. Once the prosecution, or uh, once the defense took the stand and started to talk about areas of this, this period of time, she couldn't say, but you, but you can't talk about this period. You can talk about this period, but not this period. So that, was the, that was the judge's ruling. Okay. So what about psychiatric, the psychiatric? Uh, yeah, so um, actually, um, uh, recited here for the first time, uh, the original plan was that I would prepare up the psychiatric uh, cross-examination for Jim Browning. Uh, and so I got to work, and uh, I was aided by an unsung hero. Uh, there was a woman by the name of Ellie Martin, who was a, uh, a, not only a librarian, but a terrific lawyer. And she, uh, this is before Google, guys. Um, <laughs> And she assembled a bibliography of everything that had been written uh, into, I mean, not everything, but almost everything, uh, about uh, brainwashing and coercive persuasion. And I had prepared up a five-inch high three-ring binder for Jim Browning when about three days before uh, the, uh, the psychiatrists were to take the witness stand, he came by my office. And he said, Dave, you've got to do this. And I, uh, and the reason was that putting on this case, and I was told about the number of witnesses and exhibits and everything else, putting on this case was, I'll use the word again, a real barn burner. I mean, it was um, seven days a week, 20 hours a day. Um, and so I was sitting there with three days or four days uh, to retool my mind. Uh, that I was the guy who was going to be cross-examining all these defense psychiatrists. But I was prepared, and there was a debate between Jim, my boss, and me. Jim thought that uh, the way the psychiatric testimony ought to be, don't do so much about it. Uh, all I were looking for is a wash so that when they look at their experts and our experts, they'll just say, well, I guess in order to decide this case, we better look at the evidence and, and, and just consider it sort of a standoff. My uh, thinking was that we ought to try, with respect to the defense psychiatric testimony, to blow it up, uh, detonate it. And, uh, but I tempered myself a little bit, uh, although Judge Carter at some one point said, Bancroft, you've got only one half hour more to do this examination and get done with it in any event. And the reason that I wanted to do the detonation was because we had a lot of stuff uh, that, uh, that we could work with. The principal architect of the psychiatric brainwashing defense was a guy uh, who was chair, actually, of the UCLA psychiatric department. But it turned out that he was somewhat of a, if there is something like this, a psychiatric buccaneer. He had actually overdosed an elephant uh, in an experiment with LSD. He had written about the psychiatry of scuba diving. He had volunteered on a number of cases, but all of them were glitz cases, Jack Ruby and stuff like that. Uh, 
and he had opportunistically insinuated himself before the defendant's capture by writing a personal letter to the Hearsts without ever having interviewed her or become acquainted with the facts. He claimed in his letter that she, Patty Hearst, could be brought back and that, quote, powerful arguments could be mobilized in her defense, all in effect offering his services to insinuate himself in the case. I, uh, we, we got a hold of a copy of the letter. I'm still constrained as to not be able to publicly disclose how we did that or how we even knew of its existence. But in effect, uh, her defense, so that, that was a big uh, blow, I think, that, uh, that material to her defense. And one last thing to say, uh, never, ever, in the history of mankind has there ever been even one documented instance, not in a Mao thought reform camp, not in the Civil War, not in the Korean War, nor anywhere else ever has there been an instance where coercive persuasion or brainwashing uh, has impelled someone to actually use deadly force against their own kind. So when Patty Hearst took up those one machine gun and another automatic weapon and emptied them at the store clerks at Mel's Sporting Goods store when, when Bill Harris had left the van to go buy a pair of athletic socks and tried to shoplift it and then was apprehended by the clerks and she shot at the clerks uh, and unloaded both weapons when, as Rob has pointed out, she was seated in the van alone with a key in the ignition uh, was a circumstance that could simply not plausibly be explained by her having been uh, brainwashed. Um, so there was a lot more to the psychiatric testimony, but I think that that sort of hits the highlight. Well, so one of the things that I remember uh, most about that trial was the 42 times of taking the fifth. But in the American Heiress book, um, the old McMonkey was, uh, took a central role. So t tell us about that. Yeah, so uh, there was a tape by Patty Hearst uh, called, I think we, we used to call it the Tanya tape, and in which she eulogized uh, her SLA lover, Willie Wolf, who was known as Cujo. And uh, that tape was played, and uh, we had a, a psychiatrist that we had on re retainer who would come to the courtroom, not for purposes of testifying, but to evaluate <laughs> the defense psychiatrist and to evaluate, indeed, our own psychiatrist, psychiatric testimony. And I'm walking out of the courtroom, right? through those doors one day, and he, seated in the back of the courtroom, sweeps in be behind me, and he says to me, so, oh, I'm sorry, on the tape, she says, I will always cherish the old McMonkey that uh, Cujo Willie Wolf uh, gave to me. So he comes in right behind me, and he said, hey, did you ever find the old McMonkey? I said, nope. I said that we found no Scottish dolls, no nothing that would resemble an, an old Mac, like old McDonald, an old McMonkey. The FBI on the on the uh, transcript had transcribed the words "old Mc" as "old Mc, like old McDonald, old MAC. And so I so I said, no, we never we looked high and low for this Scottish no, no doll or, or figurine, <laughs> and uh, he said, no, not not old Mac, old Mc. I said, no, no, come on, Doc. Uh, he said, no, Olmec. I said, what's Olmec? This is the problem with a, a Western civilization education. And uh, he said, Olmec. I said, what's Olmec? He said, well, no, it's a, it's a Mexican uh, a culture that he started to rattle on. I said, well, what would an Olmec monkey be? He said, oh, it's a black stone thing like this. I said, Doc, you and I are going right downstairs right now. I didn't call him Doc. I called him Doctor. Doctor, you, you, you and I are going right downstairs. We walked into Jim Browning's office, and he's sitting there with uh, an article from the New Times, sort of a leftist uh, publication, written by Emily Harris, in which 
she's reciting that um, Patty Hearst kept this Olmec, O-L-M-E-C, little stone monkey necklace in her purse. We called up the FBI and said, go down to the evidence room. Look in the purse that you seized at her arrest. If you find a little black stone monkey in there, would you please bring it upstairs and tell us about it right away? So they did, and they came back upstairs, and they came with this, with this, um, this little black stone. An identical companion piece was found around Willie Wolf's burnt neck at the home in Los Angeles that was the subject of all of the gunfire and gun store. We had an arch expert archaeologists and art history people come from Berkeley and elsewhere to testify about it. It, I'm reminded of the expression that you know, uh, big results can turn on tiny ball bearings. This is a, this is an example of that because we were we were allowed to present this in rebuttal, uh, which was extremely effective to stand in front of a jury and say, "You see this? This is this is the man who she said raped her, and the man who she couldn't stand, and she kept his memento in his purse for a year and a half." Um, so it was a uh, big rebuttal in a small package. You know, there's a there was a Second World War song called "Little Things Meet a Lot." I don't know if you, none of you are old enough to remember that, but uh, and it's certainly true here. The trials oftentimes turn on these small ball bearings that have a huge effect, and that did. So you're gone for eight weeks. You've had all those exhibits, all those witnesses. You get down to closing argument. And uh, did it make any difference? <laughs> um, I didn't give the closing argument. Jim did. And um, uh, I guess my answer is uh, we, 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 the other guys on the prosecution team and I recognized that when Jim gave his final argument, that it was just right. Uh, Jim was a, was a um, there was a little bit of country in Jim. You'd ask him how he was, and he would say, fair to Midland. Uh, that's not an expression I'm from the East Coast that anybody would use. And he was a very plain speaking, and he, he had the capacity in both his writing and in his speech to be no fancy words, just to be bell clear. And he, uh, he gave a closing argument that uh, was not going to go down in the annals of uh, rhetorical splendor, but it was so clear and in its own unassuming way, extremely uh, persuasive. It really got mixed reviews, certainly. Patty Hearst said that Jim Browning is the only person she knew who could make a bank robbery boring. Um, <laughs> described the closing as laborious, not brilliant or dazzling. Uh, Tubin said it was delivered with dogged exactitude and without much flesh. But as you read it on the page, at least, he's telling the jury, you can do this. Uh, you don't need to be a psychiatrist to determine whether someone was in constant fear during all the acts that David Bancroft was describing. You have the information, you have the capability, you have the power to decide this. And so it might have been a low-key, methodical pep talk, more like uh, Bill Walsh than Hunter Pence, perhaps. Uh, but it was a very effective in that, in, in that setting. Well, just one perspective from the law clerks who were sitting over there. Uh, I remember throughout the trial being uh, you know, somewhat starstruck by watching F. Lee Bailey doing his thing. And I had read Defense Never Rests, and I thought this was really cool. And I actually thought that you know, he was kind of having the upper hand in the courtroom, at least on occasion. But when I heard that um, closing, I wrote the words down in my notes, which I've maintained here for the 42 years since then. You should uh, see these it's, pads. It's, it's, it's great. They're, they're, they look like parchment, but they're in, they're, <laughs> it's even in pencil, some of it. It's too big a pill to swallow. I have a quote there, and of course that was one of the things, and I talked to Robin afterwards, and she said, what did I tell you? And I said, that was compelling. Well, and, and so the proof that was, was our view of it just from listening to it. The proof was in the pudding, right? The, uh, the jury came back in less than two days. Yeah. Yes, uh, we, I mean, uh, we didn't uh, end this trial uh, feeling con particularly confident. I mean, it wasn't as though 
after the closing argument and after the old McMonkey and the rest of it that we walked, uh, you know, with a real spring in our step, we, we were pretty puckered. Well, and so speaking of puckered, so th this was such an ordeal as you've described. Um, Ralph, you were telling us a little bit back there about uh, what impact you think that had on Judge Carter. Well, I didn't think about it at the time, of course. A, a little history, Judge Carter was uh, 65 when he passed away. He had had, uh, unbeknownst to me at the time, a couple of earlier heart attacks that were obviously unfatal, but they were debilitating to some extent. Right after the trial, within a week, he had another one, and it, um, it uh, put him in the hospital for several weeks. The next time I saw him was at my co-clerk Robin Donahue's wedding on the early part of June, and was, which was a Saturday, and the judge was there, and he was back uh, standing up and seemingly fine, but two days later, he had another heart attack, and, and that, that took him. Um, Peggy Betts, who was his beloved <laughs> secretary and really the one who ran the courtroom, um, always said that uh, she thought this case might kill him and it maybe very well have, have done so. Uh, Robin, I know, thought that, um, but it was distress. I mean, he had to have a marshal. He never had a marshal have to take him to lunch before. Uh, the stress of, of the press and protecting, you know, us, in fact, from it, uh, and which, and, and I think he was constantly w worried about that. So it was, it took a toll. Even though he looked like a bulldog up there on the bench and he was as strong as an ox, it took its toll. It was really something. So uh, within a week after that, uh, all the judges gathered in the robing room back there um, uh, with the clerk who had a drum. Uh, and the drum contained ballots of, with the names of all of the judges on the court, several of them, um, and, uh, and the Judge Carter's criminal cases were gonna be assigned. Uh, and so the first case to be assigned was gonna be the Hearst case, and the uh, clerk pulled out the name, it was my dad's. The second case um, that was gonna be assigned I can't, and I don't know um, which one that was, but he already had hers. The second name, my dad. So there was more than like one judge on this court. The third <laughs> case that came out was not, did not go to my father, but the fourth one did. So those who think that maybe there's some way of um, getting cases to one particular judge or another, in those days there might have been. But anyway, he got those cases, uh, and including the Hearst case. Uh, and uh, he was assigned that summer to sit in Guam. And so he flew off to Guam with my mom and a law clerk and the transcript from this uh, eight-week trial that he'd had nothing to do with. And he read the transcript because he was going to be responsible for sentencing. In those days, there weren't guidelines. Uh, his, I think the range that he had was zero to 25 uh, years. And he had to figure out what the right thing to do was. And he got a lot of advice from people. Uh, you'd be surprised to know. He got uh, some advice for nothing, some advice for 25. Uh, and, uh, and in the meantime, he was getting, as you do in these uh, big press cases, a lot of mail. And some of it wasn't very nice. Uh, and some of them uh, included uh, death threats. Um, but in any event, he was trying to figure out what to do, what the right thing was. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, his determination at the end of the day was that the jury had found her guilty of using a weapon in a bank robbery where shots were fired and people were injured. And he was going to sentence her on that basis and not on the basis of what her standing was in society, or her parents standing in society or anything else that was uh, related to it. Uh, he called up the head of the Bureau of Prisons uh, and said, what kind of a sentence should I give? And he said nine years, uh, and dad ended up uh, giving her uh, seven years. Um, and, uh, uh, and he got then a lot more death threats and angry letters. Um, the, uh, he had a couple of motions that he had to deal with uh, in the case uh, after that. Um, well, I guess I should say, after that sentence, um, eventually um, Patty, he, he granted bail to, uh, to Patty. So she was out on bail, a uh, million dollar bail. 
Uh, and she was, uh, at that time, she had a, um, her guard, her uh, protector was, uh, she was also developing a relationship with, and they got a dog, um, a big German shepherd, which they trained to attack on the command Auric. <laughs> <laughs> You can look it up. Um, <laughs> but it, so it, there was a Brady motion post-trial and a, um, a motion on um, the incompetence of F. Lee Bailey, uh, among other things. And so I thought I'd just read one thing that uh, Dad wrote. I think this was in the Brady motion, but it summarized his view of the evidence. And this is what judges do. It, they, they'll deal with the issue in front of them on the Brady motion, and Dad looked at it and said, no, the, it was fine. It should have, uh, the government was entitled to do what it, what it did. But then you always put in, and even if they weren't, there are a lot of reasons why that's okay. And so, so Dad had this uh, section. Uh, the remaining trial evidence on the issue of voluntariness consisted of the following. The verve and alacrity of defendants' movements during the bank robbery, which Dave said, vividly captured on film. The apparent sincerity of her revolutionary taped messages released by the SLA during her alleged captivity. Defendants' matter-of-fact statements to witness Matthews that her role in the robbery had been voluntary and that her alleged captors were now comrades. Indications on cross-examination of defendant that she enjoyed relative freedom during her alleged captivity. SLA documents chronicling revolutionary escapades, a major portion of which defendant admitted having written. The admitted clenched fist salutes given by defendant after her arrest. Defendant's utterance of revolutionary slogans to her friend Trish Tobin in jail. And finally, defendant's effective admission that she was armed and alone in the van when she fired at Shepard to rescue the Harrises from Mel's sporting goods. So, um, so anyway, he protected himself that way. Uh, he denied all the defense motions. Um, in 1979, um, President Carter granted uh, Patty Hearst uh, clemency. Uh, and uh, the uh, Carter administration, the White House, uh, asked uh, my father what, whether uh, he would be uh, concerned about that, and uh, he said, I did my job, you do your job. Uh, and, uh, and so he was not uh, particularly, he was not concerned about that um, uh, when that happened. Uh, and then uh, President Clinton uh, in 2000 um, uh, granted her a full pardon uh, and which is uh, one of many pardons uh, that he granted at the end of his administration, some of which um, uh, you got to wonder about. Um, yeah, but the uh, but anyway, she was she was a pardon at that time. Um, so I think those are the things that I wanted to say. Let me, Lowell, what's missing? Well, one one more thing is that if you are kidnapped on February fourth. And then you, with verve and alacrity, commit a robbery with your kidnappers on March, or a month later. Uh, does that mean you weren't kidnapped? No. And so when the trial was over, uh, Patty Hearst came to Alameda County, testified before the grand jury, and Bill and Emily Harris were indicted for the kidnap, and ultimately they pled guilty and went to prison. Uh, that's the coda. Okay. Rob, anything else that we ought to get in? I think that covers it. Okay. Dave or Ralph, are we missing something? I don't think so. No, I would just say, you know, history uh, uh, keeps being written. And I learned, uh, I learned a, a lot of stuff today that I, I had either forgotten or, uh, but most probably I never knew it. So uh, for me, this case is the history of it is still being written. So um, any questions that we can take? Uh, no, we had a, a, a genuine, a, a general practice of not doing that, um, and uh, I know that the judge instructed the jury that they didn't have to say anything, which is something like saying to them, <laughs> almost, don't say anything. Um, so the answer is no, we did not, uh, we did not question the jury afterwards. 
I learned the selection process. Uh, Judge Carter took eight days. He did it in chambers. Um, and, uh, and it sounded like at least the defense lawyers thought it took way too long. Well, I don't keep in touch with him. He uh, he uh, appeared on the CNN program. I don't know if you saw any part of it. Uh, CNN did a Jeffrey Tubin, who wrote the book uh, American Heiress, um, was part producer of a CNN program that was a multiple series. Uh, and uh, Jeffrey told me I don't, I don't know these things personally that, that Bailey, you know, has been disbarred, uh, unfortunately, and he is. Uh, doesn't have a law practice, and he operates out of a, an office above a hairdresser, I think he said, in, in uh, somewhere in Maine. Um, he had an illustrious uh, career. Uh, the thing I, I laugh about to myself is that on the CNN program, uh, he's being interviewed, and he said, uh, well, there was a problem. He said, David Bancroft was a problem. <laughs> and uh, he didn't say what the problem was, uh, or they cut that part out. But I, I had a little, uh, badge of courage. I, I got a little glow about that because when your <laughs> opponent says you're, you, you're, you're a problem, um, you're probably the kind of problem he doesn't want to have, yeah. So can you confirm the story about uh, Browning and Bailey um, talking about Judge Carter and uh, uh, perhaps uh, resting during uh, the course of proceedings? No. <laughs> <laughs> There's an apocryphal story uh, <laughs> about the two, uh, and uh, and Judge Carter might have been uh, closing his eyes. You might, who knows? Uh, and uh, and so one of the lawyers said, uh, "So, um, Judge may not be uh, awake. What should we do about this?" And uh, and the other lawyer said, "Well, if we need him, we can wake him up." <laughs> Are there any other uh, questions? Um, well, I had written, uh, as, as other people, members of the prosecution team had, even though we were not at that time in private practice, uh, I had written, I know, uh, in opposition, I know uh, actually that Bob Mueller, of more recent fame, uh, when he was U.S. Attorney here, uh, wrote a um, scathing uh, opposition to uh, clemency and uh, and to the ultimate pardon. Um, but I was, you know, um, I, I guess my reaction. I mean, I did. I, I and I still have copies. But I was somewhat torn about this. I mean, I was trying to move on. I didn't expect to. I'll be honest, when Jeffrey Tubin called me about the book, um, I, I said, are you kidding? Who, who cares about this case? It's, it's 40 years ago. Um, as I told uh, the panelists uh, before we came in, I mean, that's why Jeffrey Tubin is a very wealthy man, and I'm probably not as wealthy as he is. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, no, I, 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 I was ambivalent about it. I mean, I, I was trying to move on with my life and my legal career, and I never wanted to be a sort of a one case Johnny. So I did, I did oppose it, but I tried not to make it a life's work. So last question. I was struck by the, the note in the handout that the Jonestown massacre occurred between the, the sentencing and the, uh, the clemency. And it, there was a note in the handout material saying that the changing the views on coercion and the psychology of that. I was curious if that had happened. Do you, do you think the evidence would be perceived in the same way today that it was in that tumultuous time in the 70s? Well, I don't know. I haven't thought about it. That's a very tough comparison. I don't, I don't have a ready answer. Sorry. But you had evidence of conversion there in the field. Someone like John Wayne, uh, who had been very much pro-law and order in those days, said, my god, if people could uh, kill their own children uh, just at the suggestion of words, uh, what would any of us have done uh, in that uh, situation? So that John Wayne became someone, and when you've, you know, when you've lost John Wayne, uh, perhaps uh, it went the way. Uh, Jimmy and, Ro and especially Rosalind Carter uh, were very much followers of this uh, even before the White House. 
this was a, a, a cause for, for, for Roslyn uh, before uh, taking the White House. All right, well, thank you everybody for being here. We'll be around if you want to chat, but thank you. That's a very nice photo. There, there was a kidnapping. There was, yeah, right. <laughs> oh, and please fill out your yellow evaluation sheets. Wonderful, glad to hear it. Yeah. Yeah. Peter. Thank you. Oh, oh no goodness. kidding. Oh, was it now? Good for you. you. Thank you so much for inviting me. Well, I was hoping me. to get you out so of here. So much inviting. You need to be released. Thanks a lot. You look great. Yeah. <laughs>